This is the man who made this technology happen. This is the programmable remote control, and this is the creator of this very innovative technology. I say Dr. Joseph Jackson. Dr. Jackson, how are you doing today? Just fine, Ray, just fine. It's truly an honor to be here on camera with you today, a living legend in science. Uh, let, the, let the viewing audience know, where were you born, uh, Dr. Joseph Jackson? Uh, Jefferson Parish, Louisiana. This is just right across the Mississippi River uh, from New Orleans, in Louisiana. All right. Now, uh, in the early in your early years, did you attend public or private school? I went to public school. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, up to the seventh grade. Now, what was the racial content of the school that you attended when you were? Yeah, one hundred percent black. At that at that uh, time, we're talking about uh, well, I was born in '37, so uh, it was all black until you know they changed the, the, and integrated the schools. You know. So, how did the uh, textbooks that you were taught by the curriculum that you were required to learn in in your early years in school? How did it make you feel about being a a young black person in America? Well, I, I didn't really realize it at the time, but later I found that uh, the textbooks that was handed down to us was about 12 years behind what the white children had in the area, okay? And we, we, whenever we got books, they were new to us, but they were already used and was uh, 10 or 12 years old, you know, by the time uh, they, they got handed down to us. So, so uh, yeah, that that's that's a fact. Did you... Did you uh what type titles of were the books that you read? Did you did you were you taught the little black sambo? Did y'all read that or yeah, yeah. did did they teach you about slavery while you were in, yeah. in early school? I learned about little black sambo. I also learned a lot of uh, old anthems, uh, with Stephen Foster, old black Joe, and various uh, songs that we had to sing every morning in assembly and uh, and so forth. Yeah, it was it was quite. Uh, they, they tried to embed into us uh, that side, you know, the negative side as far as blacks are concerned, the, the sambo and so forth, eating uh, thousands of pancakes and so forth. Yeah. Uh, we're and working blacks. on rewriting the American History Book to include contributions made by people like yourself. How do you think bo uh, books that include the accomplishments of African Americans and other ethnic groups will help improve race relations in this country? Well, it will instill uh, 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 a sense of pride into our young uh, children, especially the children now, because what they see on TV is that we run fast, jump high, and bounce rubber, and, and do various things. And uh, once they get to see all of the accomplishments and, and contributions that blacks have made, such as in Venice, uh, uh, as, as a uh, founder uh, of uh, the uh, uh, Black Invention Museum, we've authenticated over 1,500 items that was uh, invented by blacks. So, and uh, when uh, young children visit the Black Invention Museum and they see, see these items, they, they're shocked because uh, no one tells them about these items. Obviously, they know about a few things, Madam C.J. Walker and the straightening comb and Garrett Morgan with the uh, traffic signal, you know, but... Uh, there's just so many other significant ideas, uh, things like the flush toilet and so forth that's used in everybody's home uh, around the world. Nobody, nobody knows that a black man invented that commode, okay? So uh, these are things that we have to uh, enlighten our young children with because they will mimic and they, they will, whatever they see out there, that's what they will gravitate towards. So it's the hip hop and the rap and whatever. That's why everybody want to be a rapper or a hip hopper or a baseball player, basketball player, football player, because that's what they see. If a little more attention was paid to the scientific side and the other creative sides of, of blacks, uh, uh, then you know that will give them some alternatives and other things to look at that, uh, that we've uh, achieved. But it's uh, incumbent upon us as a race of people to, uh, to be able to get this information out. People like yourself, Ray, that's working towards uh, doing something like this, you know. I just had a, 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 uh, an interview with uh, a young man <coughs> from down in Mount Bayou, Mississippi. They, they're getting ready to uh, re-resurrect that city and, 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 and uh, rebuild it and do a whole lot of things and, and requesting that I go down there with some of my inventions and, 
you know, to provide jobs and so forth. And I, I'm committed to doing something like that because Mount Baia is, uh, is a very historical, historical uh, place uh, as it relates to blacks. All right. Now, Dr. Jackson, how, how did you get into the electronic uh, field? What led you to uh, be have an interest in working with electronics, television? Tell us a little bit about that. Okay. Ray, because I mentioned I, I went to the seventh grade, I need to clear that up, okay? Prior to my joining the military, I spent three years in the fifth grade, three years in the sixth grade, and about six uh, six weeks in the seventh grade. And then by that time, I was much larger than most of the kids, and I quit school. And I went to work for a white lady down in Louisiana. She taught me to type. She taught me uh, about uh, delivery tickets and invoices and so forth. So by the time I turned 18, I was pretty much further along. So when I joined the Army, knowing how to type, okay, I got in some pretty cushy jobs. And in there, I found that all shades of people doing various things okay so I availed myself and then uh, a little while after being in there I took a GED test and passed it for high school but that made me eligible to go to radio and TV school which was has always been a fascination of mine now and going back to when I was about five years old <clears throat> we had a big radio that stood up in our living room TV was not that prominent at that time and I used to lie down in front of that radio and, and uh, listen and uh, one day my parents weren't at home and I, I curiosity got the best of me. I wanted to know where was the little people that was making that noise in the radio. So I kept goofing around with it and told the grill off the front and still didn't see any people. And I found this big round thing in there now that we know is a speaker. Got to goofing around with that and got a hole in it. Now it's sounding funny and I could see the wall through that hole. And well, I went in the back and I still didn't see any people and I tried to patch it up, but when I, my dad got home, I got the spanking of my life. However, he tried, he tried to explain to me that there weren't any little people in there, that this was an electronic thing and, and uh, some distance away set a transmitter and the radio being a receiver, that transmitter could send uh, radio waves, which is the voice of someone over the, over the air and then the uh, radio being a receiver would turn that uh, uh, information into intelligence of which we actually can can listen to, okay? But it was still a, a difficult thing for me to conceive of at that time, but it always stayed with me. So when I got in the Army and I got a chance to go to radio and TV school, I wanted to find that mystery out. So I studied radio and TV early, early 60s in, uh, in uh, Fayetteville, North Carolina with Fort Bragg. And then I opened my own radio and TV shop in about four months out of school, and I had it as a part-time business. I was a soldier during the day, and I fixed TVs nights and weekends for about seven or eight years in that area. So that's where I got the vast amount of experience in, in, uh, from, uh, in electronics.